In this episode of Mind Pump, we cover the most important key that gets you consistent muscle building and strength progress and also helps you burn body fat. Now, what we're talking about is progressive overload, but there's many, many ways to do this to your body. Now, you know uh, to add more weight when you get stronger. That's only one way to do it. There's eight other ways to progressively overload your body to get your body to consistently improve time and time again for long-lasting success and results. Now, this episode is brought to you by MAPS Fitness Products. Now, they are the makers and leaders in the fitness industry of the best at-home workout programs like MAPS Anywhere. They also have phenomenal mobility programs, MAPS Prime and MAPS Prime Pro, and many, many other programs. By the way, two of their most popular programs, MAPS Prime and MAPS Prime Pro, are both 50% off, and there's only one day left for this promotion. Now, these programs are flying off the shelves. We're only giving them away uh, with, while supplies last, so you might want to act very quickly. But let me tell you a little bit about MAPS Prime and MAPS Prime Pro. MAPS Prime is a program that teaches you how to prime your workouts. Now, priming is different than a warm-up. Priming gets your body ready to move better, have better ranges of motion, and to recruit more muscle fibers. In other words, if you do a proper, individualized, for your body, priming session, 10 minutes before your workout, your squats, bench presses, overhead presses, your rows, your lunges, all your exercises will become much more effective. Now, MAPS Prime Pro is all about correctional exercise. This program goes through the major joints of your body, helps you improve your mobility so that you have greater ranges of motion that you have more control over, reduce injury, and of course, because of better mobility, develop more muscle faster and get better results. Again, both of those programs, 50% off. This is the final day. You only have one day left for this massive promotion. Here's how you get that discount. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code PRIME50. That's P-R-I-M-E-5-0, no space, for the discount. I have a a a, a deeper mm. conversation that I want to have with you, gentlemen. Wow. wow that's this is serious. serious. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. Is a, this is a come to Jesus for, Whoa, for Justin. Great. Oh, good. We have to talk. <laughs> to talk I'm, glad, about, I'm glad it's centered around me. Talk about that cheese thing again. Again, <laughs> <laughs> you have a little conversation. I thought we already had this conversation. No, 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 no. On the on the real, uh, we get a lot of questions, <clears throat> and we had one just recently in a quad. I think that's what sparked the idea to do a a, a complete topic centered around this. And uh, really, it's it's the the number one key to see like consistent results, no matter what your goal is, whether it be building muscle or burning body fat or just overall health. Uh, the, the number one thing that you factor that you can manipulate to see consistent results is progressive overload. Mm, yeah, you're, you're the, the whole reason why your body gets leaner or stronger or builds muscle in the first place is really as a, as a side effect of the adaptation process. So uh, you're, that's 100% correct. The, it's the number one key for consistent results is to get your body to be able to improve uh, in how it, it performs and how it moves. It, mm-hmm. You want your body to adapt in order to yeah. continue the adaptation process along, progressively overloading it or progressively changing and uh, adding more stresses to it or getting it to want to adapt to more and more stresses is what gets it to continue to improve. Yeah, which is interesting because a lot of people throw that term around and I've heard it quite a bit, but they're usually just referring to adding weight and so more load to uh, the exercises that you're doing. And there's a lot of other factors to progressively overloading that I think not a lot of people realize. That's right. That's that's exactly how this this started. Now I remember the, the person was referring to that we've done all these different episodes and then he's like, you know, I heard episode whatever and you guys say this is the key. And then I heard this one yeah. and then I heard this is the key. And he listed off all these different variables that we've talked about how important they are. And they actually all fit in the category of progressive overload. Mm, right. I, he thought they were like competing against each other. Right. And I think that's the I think that's the topic, right? The topic in itself is understanding all the different types of ways that you can progressively overload the body. It isn't just specifically adding more weight to the bar. Right. So again, we have to remember the the process by which you get in, in better shape. Uh, is an adaptation process of the body. And all exercise is doing is it's sending a signal to get that uh, that in motion, to get that adaptation process in motion. That's all it's doing. 
Now, once the your body has adapted to the point where whatever you did to get it to adapt in the first place now is tolerable, it's now no longer a stimulus that promotes adaptation, you need to change the stimulus and you need to improve, advance the stimulus to continue more, to, to get more change. So to use a very simple example, um, if 10 minutes of sunlight gets your skin to darken a little bit to adapt, uh, very quickly 10 minutes of sunlight will no longer cause that, that adaptation process. Once my skin is adapted to the point where only 10 minutes of sunlight now is, is tolerable, then I need to do something else, something more, something different to continue that particular adaptation to keep happening. And so when you're training the body, you know, this is what you're doing. And there's a lot of factors that you can look at. Now, the easiest one is, is weight. That's a very, and it's a great one, by the way. It's not a bad one. It's a mm -hmm. phenomenal one. In fact, if you're a beginner to intermediate, uh, this is where you should spend most of your time. Most of your time should be, fo especially if your goal is to build muscle. Most of your time should be focused on, can I get myself stronger in, in an appropriate way, right, with pro proper form and all that stuff. And I would say this is actually probably one of the most common reasons why somebody doesn't continue to see change. Uh, very, very common with clients that I get. And I'd have to have this, this progressive overload conversation with them to get them to understand that would be doing their favorite at home video cassette that they follow and it's the same one every single day. Do people oh. have cassettes still? Yeah, no, I have <laughs> I still I still have clients that like follow video cassettes. Do no you, way. Yeah, wow. yeah. Wow. No, no. These are like long term clients I've had for a really long VHS? time. VHS? Yes. Wow. Yes. That had they have a favorite video. There's more people than you would you'd be surprised that do this. Mm -hmm. They have found it. It be works. Be kind rewind. Yeah, yeah. It is, you, they follow it. It works for them. Now here's the thing though. They they're using the same set of dumbbells they've been using in this workout for forever. And they like it. It makes them feel good. It makes them sweat. But they're not seeing they're not seeing consistent change in their body, and that's because their body has now become very adapted. Very common too. When I get a client who forget the at home people, someone who just belong to the gym. They've been going to the mm -hmm. gym for ten years of their life, and they've decided that they they want to ramp it up, or they they want to hire a personal trainer to learn more. And when I assess their workouts, they they would take me over. Like, well, Adam, first I. I do. Uh, I grab the tens here. Yes, I grab the yeah. tens and I do this exercise. I do fifteen pounds on the leg yes, extension. Yes, and, and they mm -hmm. have they actually have a weight number that they do for every exercise, and they've been doing that for years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is part of the reason why they have plateaued so hard and they can't see their body progress is because their body has become very efficient with that. So weight even is the most obvious one, but probably one of the most important. Ones. Well, yeah, it's one of the best metrics to actually see if your programming is effective. I think, I think it's a great way to, uh, you know, see all these other factors we're going to mention, like all, it all blends into seeing like if you are actually progressing forward with the amount of weight that you can actually move. Yeah. Your body will only ever be as strong or fit as it needs to be. It'll never be stronger or more fit than it needs to be. It only it only ever meets the demand. And this is a uh, this is again this is a part of the adaptation process. It's a good one. Um, our bodies are supposed to be efficient. Um, they 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 evolve to be that way. So there's no reason for my body to carry lots of muscle and to be strong enough to deadlift 600 pounds unless it needed a reason to be. Unless I gave it a reason to be that strong or have that much muscle. So your body will only progress as far as your your stimulus makes it progress. And one of the best ways to do that is to add weight. And this mm -hmm. this one is excellent, and this one lasts a long time. But at some point, adding weight uh, isn't necessarily advantageous. At some point, whether you plateau because you know your body's pretty smart in the sense that it figures things out and certain types of stimulus stop to work. So at some point, you start to plateau. Or even if you do a kick-ass job – you can't keep adding weight forever, right? I, yeah. I mean, I've been working out for 25 years. At this point, I'd be bench pressing 6,000 6, pounds if that was the case. Well, <laughs> and that reminds me of the other end of the spectrum of client that I would get, which is somebody who's been training for 10 years, but it has added weight year over year over year, and then they've been stuck. Mm -hmm. They've got to a point where they're like, man, Adam, I'm, you know, I've lifted this much on my bench press, my, my squat, all these things are there, and I, I just my body doesn't want to go anywhere between any, any further than that. And part of their problem is, that's the only variable they've manipulated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They've only they've only progressively overloaded through adding weight to the bar, 
and eventually they kind of hit their peak of that, and then the, and they think that they can't continue to see progress because they can't add any more weight. They've That's gotten right. as good as they could get with the skill of actually the mechanical process of actually going through the exercise. So, like, there is a skill component there that you can get a lot better at, but inevitably you're going to hit to that peak of it uh, if you don't apply all these other concepts uh, to build your overall strength up even further. Yeah, in fact, relying on any one of the um, – factors that we're going to name today will result in a very uh, hard plateau doesn't matter which one if you only rely on one and you don't know how to move through each of the ones we're about to name and manipulate them um, you're going to plateau now what does it look like when you plateau on on adding weight injury joint pain and stiffness mm -hmm. that's what it ends up looking like because you're pushing weight and you're constantly adding weight and that's the only metric you know how to push that's the only variable you know how to progressively overload Eventually, that results in either just a hard plateau or an injury um, or pain. And sometimes a regression. Sometimes yeah. you'll see yeah. you go, you know, the, nothing more frustrating than that, right? You're adding weight, adding weight, adding weight, and then all of a sudden you hit a week or two and you're weaker, and that can be very frustrating. But I will say that it's definitely the most important one to focus on if you're a beginner to intermediate for sure. Get stronger. And if you're definitely trying to build muscle, you know, if you're, if you're somebody who's got a really fast metabolism and you want to pack on muscle – Focus on getting stronger. But that's true for most people, for everybody, I would say, beginner and intermediate. Now, the next one is almost as important. Um, it's right up there, um, and it's adding reps. Mm -hmm. This one, I think people are – I see men adding weight, and women tend to want to add reps if they ever progressively overload. Right, right. Both of them, though, are very effective. So what does this look like? Well, it's very simple. If I did 10 push-ups this week, and then next time I try doing push-ups, now I'm going to try to do 11. And the following week, I'm going to try to do 12. Each time I do that extra rep, my body needs to adapt to that new stimulus by getting stronger so that if I do the same reps, it's easy. But then again, of course, I add reps. Well, yeah. it's, it's not just simply adding reps, though, too. I mean, that's one of the ways with reps. It can be just manipulating reps, right? That you, you, you alluded to something that I think is very common is, you know, uh, a lot of my men that I trained, they would like to lift really heavy and stay in that low rep range because they want to be strong they want to build muscle and they've read all the magazines that say oh lift heavy heavy weight and low repetitions that builds the most muscle mass and like like them i got stuck in the same mindset too and i would be only lifting six reps so going to the 10 to 15 rep range was one of the best things that i'd ever did the same thing is true on the opposite in the spectrum with my women client that would love to do the 15 to 20 rep range all the time never lifted five to six reps. So even though they're reducing the amount of reps, it's a new stimulus because they haven't strength trained like that before. Well, this is also addressing a lot of the myths out there that, you know, women are uh, marketed to that they're going to get bulky if they go in the low rep range. And this is something they don't want to get that boxy, that sort of like football player look. Uh, when, when in fact, uh, you know, this this change in stimulus, this change in rep range could really promote their uh, their body to change in a significant way. Uh, same thing on the other end of it with uh, your, your guy that's always doing like the, the one to five rep range and has never ventured into the, you know, the 15 rep range and the higher, uh, you know, rep range volume where that could be like the spark to cattle to, to change his physique uh, completely. Yeah, if uh, it's funny, if, if the average woman, when when she first starts working out gained five pounds of muscle she would be extremely pleased so long as she didn't weigh herself on the scale because that'll freak people out but she would be very pleased she would feel herself feel more tight muscles would feel more quote-unquote toned she'd notice that she could eat more food and she burns more calories her indirectly would start to burn more body fat she would just feel All positive benefits. and look a lot better um, and so building muscle uh, almost always, uh, unless you're talking about the extreme athlete, almost always improves someone's appearance, even from a general <coughs> standpoint. And so I'd say always aim for that when you're when you're working with resistance. I also think it's important that we kind of talk a little bit about our philosophy when it comes to uh, manipulating rep ranges, because it's a, it's a little different than what maybe some people do. And that's so they did a they did a study and it was it was quite a long time ago when they when they compared the different uh, rep ranges and if somebody followed a routine in a certain rep range uh, for an extended period of time meaning beyond six weeks and then they did somebody who changed it every like three weeks and then they did somebody who changed it every single day 
and which person saw the most results. So the person who saw the least amount of results was someone who stayed in the same rep range for an extended period of time beyond six weeks. The body would, would start to slow down its progress. So we know that's the least beneficial. And then the other two were really mm -hmm. close. So somebody who changes their rep ranges up almost every single workout or mm -hmm. somebody who changes it every two to three weeks, they change it. Now, because those were so close, we like to advise people to stick to a phase for two to three weeks. And that just comes from our experience, knowing that the, that it's easier for people to manage and actually be able to measure their results they're getting from doing that versus just constantly throwing in different rep ranges all the time and no rhyme or reason behind them. Even though that may show good benefits, it's hard for a client to really understand like, oh, what was it that I'm seeing this change in these results? I would from? say if you're if you're advanced, if you've been training for three years or more consistently, you can mix up rep ranges, uh, you know, weekly, and that's probably okay. But most people, a, a rep, different rep ranges require a different um, mental state. They require a different type of lifting. So yeah. if I'm doing a heavy set of squats for only three reps, it's very different than I'm, if I'm doing a set of 20. It's different in my technique, my form, my breathing, and the mental state. And so for the average person, you're better off training in a rep range for two or three weeks so you can get into this, that zone of that rep range, how it feels, what it's like, get good at that rep range before moving to another one. But if you're advanced and you know your body – Mixing it up, I guess, is okay. Right, because you're kind of taking out the element of getting better at a skill, which uh, we've talked about a little bit about. A lot of people don't really recognize exercises as their own individual skill. You think of a sport as doing certain movements as, I want to get better at throwing a ball. I want to get better at uh, sprinting off the line. I want to get better at all these very, like, very specific things. Uh, but exercise is no different. If I want to do an exercise really well, I have to be – in the right mindset, I have to uh, have the right mechanics. I have to, uh, you know, be very focused. I have to have all these factors play together. And to do that, I want to make sure I at least give myself enough time to to reap the benefits of that. Well, that's that's why I actually think it's different. I don't think it's exercise. What I say is, there's exercise and then there's training. If you're just exercising, anything can be considered exercise. Going out for a ride on a bike or moving around doing right. jumping jacks having no rhyme or reason for what you're doing, just moving can be considered exercise, but training mm -hmm. is more methodical. There's more, there's a reason behind it. I am training to lose 15 pounds of body fat. I am training yeah, to a build plan. muscle. Yeah, exactly. So there's where the, the skill of it that I think is, is so important. And there's where the advice of, Hey, focus on a rep range for a block of time, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere between two and four weeks is probably ideal. And during that time, you are practicing that skill, that skill set, and you're not so much exercising, you are training. Right. But at the end of the day, very basic. If you did 10 reps with 100 pounds this week, and next week you did 11 reps with 100 pounds, you have progressively overloaded your body. You did an extra rep. And so that's one more very important, simple way you can use progressive overload to get your body to progress. The next one is also very important. Um, I think it's a li it's it's a it's somewhere I go after I do the first two with typically with clients, and that's simply to add more volume. That's literally just means more work, more sets, more exercises. So let's say you did squats for ten reps this week uh, with hundred pounds, and next week you could either add more weight. So now I could do one hundred and ten pounds. Or I can add a rep, or I'll just do an extra set. So I do the same weight, same reps, but now I did two sets of that exercise rather than one. And now I've progressively okay. overloaded my body just through volume. Now, this is my favorite to teach an experienced lifter. Uh, I agree with you that I think that weight and reps are like the first place that you teach. For the sure. Very basic fundamental thing, uh, uh, idea of like how you continue to progress, progress the body. But I love to teach volume to an experienced lifter and i think maybe that's because it took a long time for me to really piece the importance of this and actually get to the point where i was tracking this so first of all you have to understand how to calculate what volume is so that's it's set if you do sets reps and weight you multiply them so i multiply my sets by how many reps i do times the weight i do that equates to the volume and if you figure out and, and, I, and I love to take somebody. So if you're listening right now and you're more of a intermediate to advanced lifter, just for shits and giggles, follow this formula, track out your total volume in the workout and or for specific muscle groups. 
and see where that adds up with the total amount of poundage is at the end of the week that will equate. Okay. I did this many, you know, thousands of pounds for legs. I did this many thousands of pounds for arms I did, and figure that what, what that is. And then just slightly increase that over the course of the next couple of weeks. And you can do it through the other two variables that we talked about, either adding more repetitions or adding more sets or weight to the bar. This will all equate to more volume, mm -hmm. but just doing a little bit. You don't need to do a lot more. In fact, you don't want to do a lot more. You just want to add a tiny bit of volume. If you can do that, this is, this is how I progressed my body when mm -hmm. competing. I was very diligent about measuring where I was when I first was getting ready for my very first amateur show. And then I, I made a point that from show to show to show, if I was going to continue to, to present a physique that was progressed, that was better than the last one, w one of the key factors for me to make sure I did that was to just slowly increase volume over time. Well, yeah. and this, this sort of reiterates the, you know, the importance of having a plan and being able to even track that, right? Like even knowing how many sets you did, how many reps you did, like, this is, this is the plan I'm bringing in. So that way you can make these small adjustments and manipulate just enough for the end of the week. So your, your sum total is going to go up just enough. So that way your body keeps progressing forward. Yeah. Tracking all these things is real important because here's what ends up happening. Um, you, and this is like, it's like this with diet. So let's say we'll use diet. For example, let's say you, you're trying to be at a, a you know, a, a thousand calorie deficit every single day, Monday through Friday, you do great. Saturday and Sunday come, come around. And you screw up a little bit and you eat a little bit over what you were supposed to. Now that adds up to the average, the total average. And what you find when people do that is they end up breaking even. So if you've increased your volume too much, sometimes what will end up happening is someone feels too sore or gets sick. They don't work out an extra day. They take a day off. Now the total volume for the week is about the same as it was before. So you're not progressing. So tracking your volume makes a big difference. And, you know, Adam mentioned – <laughs> moving it up just a little bit. Here's the thing with resistance training. There's a right dose for your body. Yeah. Anything more than that and anything under than that means you get results slower. It means your body progresses less. And the further away you move from that right dose, the worse your results are. In fact, the further above that right dose you go, the closer you get to injury and illness. So anytime you're progressively overloading your body, it's smart to progressively overload it just a little bit. In fact, I learned this lesson years ago when I was uh, chasing a 600-pound deadlift, which for me was a, a big, big uh, lifetime goal. And w the way I used to do it was I would lift, and then if I felt like I could add 15 pounds, that's how much weight I added. I always added the most amount of weight that I thought I could add. Well, later on, what I figured was that this resulted in erratic strength gains. I would gain strength, and then i plateau for a while. So what I used to do then is if I got stronger, and let's say I knew I could add 15 pounds, I only added five. I only added five. I, I went less than what I knew I could do, but I still went over what I did before. It gave me much more consistent progress because the dose was more appropriate. So this mm -hmm. is how you want to apply volume is if you do figure out your total volume, don't add as much as you think you can do. Don't think to yourself like, man, last week I went through that workout. This week I bet I could do twice yeah. as much. Don't do that. Just add a little bit and watch what happens, and you're, you, you're much more likely to have consistent results. Now the next one, less popular – but uh, very important. This one's a good one, and yeah. this is very simple. Increase your range of motion. Yeah. This one. This one can make tremendous. Uh, you wouldn't think progress. that initially, right? No. Like, I think a lot of people wouldn't even consider this as a factor. Right. So to give you an example, it's like if I did a squat down to parallel with 100 pounds, then next week I do a squat an inch lower than parallel with the same amount of weight. Now what I'm doing is I'm just working on getting a greater range of motion with the same resistance. The greater range of motion is progress has added more overload to my body because it's more difficult. Now, I, I love talking about this, especially during this time right now, right? Because it's really tough. If you're a hardcore power lifter, bodybuilder, been training for a really long time, uh, I know this is a rough time for a, a lot of the guys and girls out there that are going through this because they're like, oh my God, I don't have access to my gym. And this is part of what uh, motivated us to do the webinar is to help teach people to work on this. this is a great time to focus on something like this like hey you talking about mobility yes oh, yeah. and and work on getting increased range of motion and you know there's, there's some there's some people that put out some videos that i thought were pretty good to try and uh talk to people about hey when, when we're we don't have access to all these barbells and dumbbells and the ability to put a bunch of weight on the likelihood you're going to see lots of progression is is just not realistic and so instead of being hung up on it 
you know, let it go for right now. And then when you get back in, you can do that. And there's some truth to that, right? It's really, if you've been lifting for a long time and you're used to lifting really heavy weight and then to take all that heavy weight away from somebody and expect that they're also going to progress and see major gains during this time is less likely, but it doesn't mean that they can't improve on something like this. And Sal alluded to this when we were talking about mobility the other day, that maybe you don't you know, see major muscle that you put on by working on all this. But what ends up happening when you get back to the gym and you start training all those exercises and those, those heavy lifts with a new found range of motion, right. you'll see a huge difference in gains start to pile on then. Those unfamiliar uh, positions that your body is in, like those ranges of motion where it's a little bit deeper than you would have liked the bar to go, but now you have to dig your way out. Well, that's that's important. That's a, a whole nother category that you have to focus on adding strength to. And mobility helps you kind of provides provides the answer to that. It helps you stay in that in that particular position and to really emphasize uh, how how can I recruit, you know, more effectively the amount of muscles that I need to be able to produce the force to to, to get me strong in this. And so it's not necessarily I'm I'm trying to, to stretch to a range of motion that's you know gets me way further like w way more flexible and, and way more able uh, it, it's more of like how strong can I get even further within this range I, a very clear example is I had a client not that long ago that I helped out with like their squat depth like we put up they just they had a really tough time getting anywhere beyond 90 there's really really tight tight hips lacked a lot of ankle mobility very close to home for me it was my issue and so I spent a lot of time helping him out with that and one of the things that he realized was, you know, now that he got this new range of motion, he was able to get deeper. He wasn't quite as strong as what he was when he was stopping at 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. But the thing that blew him away was like, he, and he couldn't figure out, he's like, I don't understand, Adam. I'm squatting 100 pounds less than what I was squatting before, but my legs are as developed or more developed what mm -hmm. they were before. And that's an example of how you can see those type of benefits because you are now using a greater range of motion, which is now recruiting more muscle fiber. So you can potentially Your strength curve just expanded. Exactly. And so you could potentially develop more muscle, even with less weight. Yeah. And studies are pretty clear on this. Um, whenever you're, unless you're talking about sports specific strength adaptations, uh, full ranges of motion are superior in terms of total strength gain. Um, and in terms of muscle development, when compared to the same exact exercise with a reduced range of motion, a full bench press done properly will build more muscle and more overall strength than a half bench press. This is true for every single exercise. I remember when I was a kid and I learned this firsthand. I remember working out in the gym and wanting to curl a certain amount of weight on a preacher curl. And I, did, I always went real heavy, so I stopped just short of fully extending my arms. And I had an older gentleman tell me, hey, try doing that full range of motion with light weight and see what happens. And I saw my arms change mm -hmm. in a very, very short period of time because, as Adam was saying, you do rec recruit more muscle fibers and you get better results. And so one way to progressively <coughs> overload your body is when you're doing an exercise with a certain amount of weight and you're doing a certain amount of reps and now you feel stronger in it and you feel easier and you think, okay, I can add weight or I can add reps or I could do more sets – one thing you can do is say, you know, I'm not going to do any of those. All I'm going to do is a deeper, fuller range of motion. And then that fuller range of motion now feels more challenging to you. So you've overloaded your body without doing anything other than extending upon your range of motion. Now, I think it's also important to note that, you know, we're not recommending somebody who is never squatted past 90 and is got really yeah. tight hips to go and, way past that. right is to go way past it has that. to be appropriate and proper right and and probably the best way to do that is not necessarily with any weight on the bar it's to work on the mobility issues right mm -hmm. if a lot of people that can't break 90 degrees it's normally some sort of a limiting factor in their hips or ankles that's the most common mm -hmm. so if that's what's the, where the issue is you don't need any weight to start working on ankle and hip mobility to improve that, and then you can go back to squatting deeper and deeper versus, oh, the guys on Mind Pump said this is a great way to progressively overload. I'm going to start working on a deeper range of motion in my squat, mm -hmm. and you haven't done the prerequisites to be able yeah. to do that. First, you must gain stability, right? And, and you have to be able to be comfortable uh, in that lower position. If you're not even comfortable in that yet, you got a lot of work to do. And once you gain that comfort, you gain that stability, then we can start like gradually loading that. So it is like in itself an entirely new exercise, and that's how you kind of have to approach it. Well, like any of these, it's a very small incremental process. So if your squat is to 90 and you going any, and when, once you go lower, it gets much harder. 
even if you go down, uh, you know, four centimeters lower than, than, than 90, you've added a greater range of motion, which is going to progressively overload your body. Um, the next one I, is also extremely important. In fact, this one's one of my favorites. This one has, the one I'm about to mention right now, has the best longevity. And it's something that you can practice forever. It, as you get better at it, it reduces the risk of injury. And it sets you up to do any other way of progressive overloading even better. And that's just perfecting your skill and your technique. Mm -hmm. Perfecting it. What I mean by that is, you know, we, we talked about exercises as, as, you know, as skills. And they are skills. You're squatting, you're pressing, you're pulling, you're doing a pull-up. That is a skill. There is a way to do it that's better than other ways of doing it. And so sometimes when you do five reps on a pull-up and you think, wow, I could do seven reps now. Instead of doing seven reps, do five reps, but do them better than the, than, than the way you did them before. Do them more perfect with better control and better form. It's With this particular way of overloading the body, it's all about getting better and better and better technique as you get stronger. You know, you definitely refer to bodybuilders a lot when talking about this stuff. I think they're some of the best at, at doing this, right? They... They, they pick an exercise and they focus so much on form and technique. And to me, that that highlights them. And I, as, as we're going through these, I can't help but think of like an avatar of a type of a lifter that does really good with one or two of these variables. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at the list that we made, like you can't help but kind of look at it and go like, oh, the, right. the power lifters do a really good job of doing volume. Uh, and I and, would have to say that the yeah, power lifters power are lifter probably – and Olympic lifters yeah. too, yeah. They're, they're probably the best with technique because power lifters and, and Olympic lifters are – they don't care about necessarily developing I would developing say muscle. Olympic lifters over power lifters for technique. But I, both of them. They're, they're, so, yeah. they're practicing it so – like a power lifter is practicing it to, to maximize leverage constantly you watch them get in position that's for their true. lift that's well, true. and they've reduced down the amount of exercises to a few that they're just trying to master yes. but uh yeah so that's i mean that's a factor and, and i know what you're trying to say in terms of like being able to fuel their way through exercises bodybuilders do a great job of of being able to really feel and, and highlight yeah. certain muscles that they need to highlight in that exercise yeah yeah well the technique part you're right with the olympic lift and what's neat too if you if you've ever trained like an olympic lifter or with one or seen one train you'll notice that a lot of times very very lightweight oh yeah it's the the emphasis is not put it sometimes you get we get so focused on the first one that we talked about is just adding weight to the bar but there is a great way to overload the body by just perfecting the te technique getting absolutely better if you watch like a, a great boxer or martial artist they will practice a jab or a straight or a kick over and over and over they'll practice it without an opponent they'll practice it in the air over and over and over again then they'll hit a bag then they'll practice it on a live opponent what they're doing is they're perfecting their technique this is what you can do with your exercise literally if you don't want to add weight or reps or volume or range of motion all you got to do is make the exercise look better mm -hmm. be more have the perfect technique each time and trust me there's a lot of room here I've been working out for decades, and I can make my deadlift, which is my strongest exercise, I can sit there and make the technique better and better and better, not have to add any weight on the bar, but feel it become more and more intense because of the technique improvements. Well, something under. I've always kind of thought, too, and there's been an argument on which is better, you know, certain machines versus, like, you know, these compound lifts and why – I tend to lean more on the, the high skill type exercises because of that fact is there's so many moving parts and to be able to master a certain uh, skill of being able to, you know, backload squat, for instance, uh, it requires so many moving parts and so many things to, to work harmoniously. And so it, it, it really is a challenge. It's more of a challenge that your body is then going to reap the benefits from. Well, this reminds me, too, of some of the DMs that I've been getting right now with everyone being trapped at home. And, you know, we've got some of these advanced lifters that are following like our Maps Anywhere program. And they're telling me, you know, Adam, I'm really advanced. And do you think that this program is too easy for me? I said, man, I just did a workout the other day and roasted my ass. I can take a single leg toe touch, which is a very basic movement that mm -hmm. I had with my 65 year old clients that I would do. And I can make that shit roast me. Yeah. If you focus, if you get barefoot and focus the way your feet are gripping on the bar, the way your knee is tracking when you do it, the way you hinge back with your hips, the way you keep your spine, mm -hmm. the position you keep your neck and your head in when you do it. I mean, there is so many little nuances to a simple movement like that, that yeah, you can just breeze through really fast and do 10 reps. Or you can take and say, you know what? I'm going to make this so beautiful and move so perfectly through the whole thing and focus on every aspect from my toes 
all the way up to my head and the way I position everything, you can take an exercise like that and make it extremely yeah, difficult. And the best way to work on this one is to work with a weight that is not your maximal weight. It mm -hmm. is to work at an intensity that's not your maximal intensity. If you want to work on perfecting technique, it needs yeah. to be practiced over and over again. So don't pick a weight that's your, the hardest. Don't do reps that are bringing you close to failure. Don't do so much volume that you're super fatigued. Just practice the exercise and continue to practice it better. Perfect practice makes perfect, right? And then you'll get better at this perfecting technique. And each time you do better with your form, you are overloading the body, and the body is learning to adapt through that process. Yep. Now, the next one is, is the one that I think the bodybuilders are the best at, which is the mind-to-muscle connection. Mm. I have yet to meet a strength athlete that can feel a specific muscle with almost any exercise like a bodybuilder. Like I could watch a bodybuilder change a bench press yeah. to be pec focused, to be tricep focused, or to be delt focused all within the same the, exercise. The only other one I could even possibly think of would be like a gymnast. And, and that's mainly just because they have to, they're, they're so body aware in their movements. But in terms of like being able to squeeze and flex a muscle on command, like a bodybuilders are masters. Well, you that. remember this was a good, uh, good debate that we had with uh, Ben Pakulski back mm -hmm. and forth. I mean, he would argue this is the most important. Yeah. I yep, mean, he, yep. he would argue this over even progressive overloading weight. Mm -hmm. uh, he comes from the camp that, you know, if you do a really, really good job of focusing on a movement, you can recruit more muscle fibers through that than anything else. Yeah. So there's definitely a case to be made that this could go. And I like this one a lot for safety reasons. Yes. Yeah. Right. So you know, it's if great you, for longevity. That, that's too. the knock that I have on progressively overloading weight and going there. It's the easiest one. It's the simplest for people to measure and explain to somebody. Like, hey, last week you were lifting 10 pounds. Now this week let's lift 15 pounds. But the truth is, if you are a relatively new lifter just adding weight a lot of times as soon as you start to lift a little bit heavier weight than what you're used to form goes out out the window or it starts to suffer at one point mm -hmm. where maybe focusing on progressively overloading the focus the mind muscle con uh, connection and technique type of direction may be a lot more beneficial and a lot of times maybe where i focus with my advanced age type clients yeah i like mind to muscle because it does give you better awareness also like i can i can make an exercise far more difficult for my target muscle simply by concentrating and isolating mm -hmm. and working that muscle through my mind. I mean, I could do a chin-up, a, a, a supinated grip, that's a palms back uh, chin-up, and I can make it just work my lats. I can make it work my lats really, really well. I can also make it work my biceps really, really well. I can even make that exercise hit my rhomboids and my mid-back really, really well by changing where I'm focusing the effort and the squeeze. Right. And each one of those variations is a slight change in technique. And the average person watching me do each one of those reps wouldn't notice a huge difference. They'd be like, oh, each one he's doing is a pull-up. Yeah. Now, someone who's advanced would be able to watch and be like, oh, wow, he's he's making his biceps do more of the work. He's well, making his lats do more of the work. Yeah, there's an interesting carryover there, too, when you come back to just you know movement and performance training. Uh, being able to be that aware of how, uh, you know, the feel of how everything is going in the movement, you can adjust on the fly so much more effectively because you can feel your body react and feel which muscles are working more. And, you know, you're able to adjust a lot more, which then helps you to then, uh, you, know, you know, carries over into the overall movement. Yeah. One thing that I love uh, most about one of the top things I love about resistance training so much is it a lot more than any other form of exercise. It gives you the ability to be able to shape and sculpt your body in very specific ways, almost like a sculptor. I know of no other form of exercise where you could literally look at your body and say, I want more muscle here. I want more shape here. I want more curve there. Typically, with other exercise modalities, you do the workout and your body takes the form and shape of whatever it is that gets you good at that particular skill. But with resistance training, and in particular with what we're talking about right now, which is the mind to muscle connection, I can specifically shape and sculpt my body. That's why bodybuilders, again, are so good at this. The sport of bodybuilding is literally what it's all about is having the most symmetrical, well-developed, balanced physique. And if you're like, if you're, you know, bodybuilders are humans and all humans have muscles that develop faster than others or some that look more dominant. So when you're looking in the mirror and saying, hey, I want more muscle here, I want more shape here, mind to muscle allows you to use resistance training in this way to where you can really shape and sculpt your body to the point where no joke if you know how to do this well 
you can make a bench press develop your lower pecs more or your upper pecs more. Same exercise. Simply by concentrating and squeezing on the exercise. You can also make an exercise far more challenging just through the mind-to-muscle connection. Oh, yeah. So if you're stuck at home and you're doing push-ups and you're like, man, I'm good at push-ups. I, you know, for me to get mm. tired, I got to do like 70 of them. I tell you what, slow them down, squeeze and focus on the muscles you're trying to target, and you'll do half. I, yeah. You know, I, I can't help but think of clients. How many times did you guys have a client that was doing like a tricep push-down and they fill it in their biceps too? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's oh, like, yeah. what? You know, so even for somebody who's not like really, really advanced or trying to be a bodybuilder, the importance of this is just getting the most out of every even basic exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, learning to be able to push down for the tricep push down and know that you're trying to utilize the tricep and not allow the shoulders to roll forward and other muscles. I love training a client that really grasps this concept and does have very good control of all their muscles because then you can give coaching cues like, you know, less shoulders, more tricep here. Oh, retract this, squeeze here, resist with your back when you let out. You can start giving them cool cues because they they understand how to control all these different muscles and then you can get the most out of every movement. It's funny because you're you're pretty much fighting your body's uh, natural instinct to make things more efficient. And, and and exactly like that that's just going to be a constant battle your whole life. Like if you want to just sit and lean forward, your body's going to make that the thing and nothing else and it's going to like take all these other factors out and just focus on making you effective with that. So you you you're fighting that 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 innate uh, ability your body has to make things really effective for you, but like you're training your body to do things a certain way to produce uh, what you want out of it. Yeah, at the end of the day, by the way, all of these are aiming to make things harder for your muscles that's really all what it really breaks down to right so when we're talking about mind to muscle what you're doing is you're trying to make the exercise feel harder by working the target muscle more than you would if you're trying to make the exercise easier now the next one is my favorite to point out when i go into any gym and i've said this on the podcast before it's been a while since i've brought this up but the next time you're in the gym pay attention to the tempo at that everybody works at and I love this one because there, we've done enough studies and research to to be able to say what, you know, oh, training in the hypertrophy range is the best place for building muscle. Well, part of the hypertrophy quadrant or range also includes the tempo. And that tempo is a 4-2-2, two, two, meaning I go four seconds on the negative. I pause for two seconds in the isolation part of the exercise or isometric part of, portion of the exercise. And then I go two seconds on the way up, right? So if we're like comparing to a bench press. But the next time you're in the gym, pay attention if you see anybody do a negative for four seconds or Nobody. longer. Nobody. You never see this. Mm -hmm. So it is such an easy way to progressively overload the body for somebody that's been lifting for a really long time and say, hey, you know what, today I'm not going to change your routine at all. You're going to do everything you normally do, but all I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count your negative, and I want you to slow it down to four seconds. Something. Watch what that workout looks like. In each one of these uh, variables is something to consider, isometrics or you know just the concentric portion. So if I want to just do something explosively and not slow the momentum on the way down, you know that's a completely different stimulus that your muscle is going to react to. But also isometrically, like I want to hold, hold, hold that position as long as I can. It's training the muscle to, to react in a completely different way. Yes, so slow. Slowing reps down makes exercises a lot harder. So does speeding reps up. Now, a lot of times people think, well, what do you mean? If I go faster, it feels easier. No, no, no. You're missing the point. The point is not to do fast reps and then do as many as you can. The point is to do fast reps and then stop when you can't move the bar that fast anymore. That's how you utilize fast reps. So if I'm doing explosive squat, I'm going to go down on the rep, come up as fast and hard as I can, and I'm going to do that until... I can't move that fast anymore. Now I'm done with the set. And believe me, the effort that you put into a lift when you're trying to move it quickly is actually quite high. So rep tempo is a phenomenal way of overloading your muscles. You can literally get stronger in an exercise, not add weight, not add reps, not add volume, not add anything. Just change the rep speed and watch your body start to progress again. And if you're listening right now, the best thing that you can do personally is the opposite of which one you tend to lean more towards. So if you heard me say that about slow reps and you're like, no, Adam, I, I go pretty slow. I'm always very slow and controlled. If you're always very slow and controlled, the next time you go to a workout, make it an explosive workout. Mm -hmm. Everything is explosively yeah. one, one, one. It's power. It's fast. You doing a lift like that, it will shock the body because you're so used to the opposite. And if you're somebody who you know, uh, relates more to powerlifting and you love, or my, my athletes tend to do this, right? Justin's notorious for this. This is how he likes lifts. So if you watch 
if you got him and I in the gym and we both did bench press, he would look more like a, a power lifter lifting the bench press. I would look more like a bodybuilder lifting the bench press. And the truth is what each of us will benefit most is doing the opposite because I gravitate more towards the slower control tempo. Me going in and saying, you know what, today I'm going to lift for power. I'm going to stack some more weight on there. I'm going to do it explosively a couple times. That's it. And then the same is true for Justin. Opposite that would benefit him the most is going in and saying, oh, I'm going to train more like a bodybuilder, slow my tempo down. Now, years ago, I learned about this next one, and uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember when I, you know, when I first started working out, my number one goal is to build as much muscle as possible. And when you would read the muscle magazines in those days, they all said that you needed to rest – two to three minutes in between sets because that's how you got the strongest. That's how you built the most muscle. And so that's what I did. In between sets, I literally would not do another set unless two minutes passed. And I would always do this. Hmm. Then I read this article by a bodybuilder. I can't remember his name, but he talked about doing lots of supersets and cutting his, his, his rest periods short. And he said that just by cutting his rest periods short, he built muscle. And I thought, that's interesting. I've never done that before. Let me give it a shot. Mm -hmm. So I had a stopwatch. And I allowed myself to rest 30 to 45 seconds. That was it. Now, I had to dramatically reduce the weight. Couldn't lift as much as I did before. But holy cow, did I get a ridiculous pump when I did it that way. And then by staying that way for the next few weeks, my body built muscle again. I actually got my body to progress again simply by cutting rest periods a little bit shorter. Now, the reverse is also true. If you're somebody that rests 20 to 30 seconds in between sets, Rest one to one and a half minutes in between sets, mm -hmm. and you'll see the same thing happen. This is another one that I think is really easy to point out or easy to recognize in yourself because I do feel like there's a real clear divide of like what camp you kind of are close to. You're yeah. either like the power lifter where you have like you lift and the you forever go, rest. Yeah, yeah, you rest for yeah, three to five me. minutes. You talk to each other. You wrap your knees up. You chalk up. You get yeah. your favorite song on. That person right there, if you lift like at that cadence, boy. You take that person and you shut them down to one minute or shorter rest periods or lots of supersets, they're going to see a huge response in their body. The same thing is true for the person who loves to do supersets. Like, so I love to take the, the bodybuilders and the people that love to do supersets, compound lifts, tri-sets, you know, short 30-second to one-minute rest. All of a sudden, hey, today we're going to go real slow. We're going to rest three to five minutes between every set that you do, but we're going to load it. We're going to go for strength and power in this lift. So whichever one <laughs> you know you gravitate to the most, switch it up by doing the opposite. Yeah, and I think, too, it, it sort of feeds into, uh, like, for instance, so if I'm if I'm lifting really heavy and I really want to focus on the mechanics and the skill and all this stuff, like, usually resting a bit longer really, like, helps aid into that, yeah. that process versus, like, you know, cutting it short and doing supersets. It's really hard to focus in and, and really – uh, you know, get get my mechanics and my the perfection of 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 the form of it. But on on the other end of that, like really feeling the muscle and like working your way through those sets uh, with uh, less rest. I mean, man, you really feel those muscles uh, get get pumped up with blood. Yeah. Now, now there there is a range, right? There is a range. Um, you you want to probably if, unless you're doing a superset. You want to rest at least 25 to 30 seconds. That would be in the short range. And you can rest as long as five minutes if you're doing really, really heavy sets. But that's a wide range to play with. Now, the reason why I said that is because when we say manipulate the, the rest period, I know there's, there might be some people like, cool, I'm not having any rest periods, and I'm just doing 15 exercises in a row, in which case you're not really doing resistance training anymore. You're doing more like cardio mm -hmm. uh, with weights. Now, the last one, this one is one that I think people are very familiar with. Um, but it's also one that can sometimes be abused. The uh, most abused, I would But say. when it's used properly, yeah. can be really good, which is intensity. Just add more intensity. Push your body harder. Now, you can push your body harder with a lot of the stuff that we just talked about. Right. Every single one that we just talked about is one way to do this, but there are other intensity techniques. These are advanced, right? But you could do something like partial reps. So partial reps are, if I did bench press, and I'm doing six full reps, and I know I can't perform a seventh rep, then I'm going to perform three half reps. And then when I'm done with those three half reps, I'm going to do another two quarter reps, and then I'm done. It's like squeezing out more work within that given set. And training to failure falls into this category right. too. Yeah. Now we, we advocate for people uh, training with two shorts or two uh, reps in the tank, right? That's what we normally say. But it doesn't mean that none of us ever train to failure. It's just that m very few people need to hear that because I think it's abused. I think it's 
overly used in our space because it just seems to be, oh, just tr- I'll take it to failure each time and I get sore the next workout. And that's where this gets abused, where we're constantly chasing the soreness as a way to measure how well the, how the well the workout was. It's, this is just one more variable. It's just one more way that I can progressively overload the body to keep keep adding weight or keep getting stronger or keep losing body fat is by increasing your intensity. But again, there's a ceiling to this. Like yeah. if, if every time you, you can't come to every single workout and increase intensity. So you no. can get it real quick. You can run into a wall by always chasing that type of And it's of addictive a, too. I mean, you see this in the one rep max chase, the PR, you know, chasers out there that are, that they see this, this, this crazy boost in strength. And now, uh, you know, this is becomes a, a repeated workout where they're, they're trying to keep chasing that, that the best PR trying to best what they maxed out on completely. And, you know, there's, there's a, very much of a cap to that. And, and you have to be careful, uh, you know, what that leads to. I, I also love having this discussion about these, right? right? So we've, we've listed nine of these that w- are ways to progressively overload, right? To, to, co- to consistently see results in the body, no matter what your goal is. And honestly, eight of these nine, every single person can, can manipulate without adding weight. So eight of the nine, without, if you don't have more barbell weight, if you right. don't have more dumbbell weight, at your house, you can't physically add more weight to the bar. That is the only variable of all the variables that we just listed. And this is why you still can make great progress at home. If you understand these, if you understand all the different ways to overload the body and you're stuck with just the same pair of dumbbells or one barbell or very minimal amount of weight at your house because we're all stuck at home right now, it doesn't mean you can't manipulate these other eight variables to p- continue to see progress. In fact, uh, when we created uh, Maps Anywhere, um, which we designed for people to you know work out without weights, that's exactly what we did because you're not working out with weights. It's hard to add resistance. So what we did is we manipulated the other all these other you know factors that you hear. Which is why everyone from beginner to intermediate will follow a program like that and feel and see results because all those are within your control. So at the end of the day, here's the thing. You can overdo all of these or you can focus only on one of these and watch your body plateau. But if you mess with all of these and you do them in a systematic way where sometimes I add weight, sometimes I do a little bit more reps, this time I'm going to add a little bit more volume. Oh, let me increase my range of motion. Let me feel the muscle more. Let me perfect my technique. Let me speed up my reps. Let me slow down my reps. Let me look at my rest periods. But you do it in a very methodical, slight, very small incremental way. You will see in your body consistent long-term results until you start to reach your genetic muscular potential. And, and let me tell you, every single person listening right now has not reached that potential. So there's still a long way to go uh, by using these types of, uh, of factors and techniques. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our guides, resources, and books. You can also find us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.